Hi and welcome back. In our last videos, we already spoke about light in the ocean and how it influences colors on the water. In this video now, we will go more into detail into a specific part of the solar spectrum, into the highly energetic and short wavelength of the UV radiation. Have fun! When we are generally talking about light underwater, and especially the colors of marine animals and plants, we're only speaking about a part of the solar radiation that reaches the Earth. The full spectrum actually reaches from the short wavelengths within the UV part of the spectrum over the photosynthetically active radiation, which is the visible light, to the long wavelengths within the infrared part. For today's video, we will focus now only on the highly energetic wavelength of the ultraviolet radiation. The most energetic UV radiation, the UVC, is lethal, but nearly all is absorbed by ozone and oxygen in the atmosphere. However, both UVB and UVA radiation can reach the Earth's surface and are potentially damaging to living organisms. Although 9% of the sun's radiation is UV radiation, much less reaches the Earth's surface, because ozone in the stratosphere strongly absorbs it. For that reason, the stratospheric ozone layer is often called the ozone shield. The thickness of the stratospheric ozone layer varies seasonally and latitudinally, owing to differences in the amount of sunlight in a region. Water vapor and aerosols also absorb UV radiation, so little of it reaches the sea surface or ground on a very cloudy day or when the air is polluted. The proportion of UV radiation that is able to reach the organisms here on Earth is therefore dependent on this ozone shield. During recent decades, man-made chemicals and particularly chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, used as refrigerants, fire suppressants and propellants, have destroyed portions of the ozone shield, allowing more UV to reach Earth's surface. These gases can be released into the atmosphere both deliberately or accidentally, in the mistaken belief that they are inert, meaning without an influence. When the CFC molecule comes in contact with the ozone, a cyclical reaction starts that can repeatedly destroy the ozone layer. Because the problem of these CVCs is that when ultraviolet light strikes the CVC molecule in the upper atmosphere, a carbon-chlorine bond breaks. This then produces a free chlorine atom. The chlorine atom can then react with the ozone molecules. The ozone molecule is breaking apart, forming an ordinary oxygen molecule and the chlorine monoxide molecule. When this free oxygen atom now reacts with the chlorine monoxide, this is also breaking apart. Producing again a free chlorine molecule that can repeat the process of destroying more ozone molecules. A single CFC molecule can thus destroy up to 100,000 ozone molecules. That is why, in 1978, the United States, Canada and Norway enacted bans on CFC-containing aerosol sprays. However, CVCs continue to be used in other applications, such as refrigerators and industrial cleaning. But in 1985, an extreme depletion of ozone over Antarctica was discovered, the so-called Antarctic ozone hole. It soon became clear that this drop in ozone was caused by the man-made chemicals and to help solve the global depletion of ozone, the international community regulated CFC production and consumption in 1987 through the Montreal Protocol. Today, all of the world's 197 countries have signed this treaty. Although this and subsequent actions have now effectively banned CFC production and put the ozone layer on a path to recovery, long-lived CVCs in the atmosphere continue to affect ozone levels to this day. The lowest concentrations were measured in 1995. In this animation, you see 30 years of changes in ozone concentrations over the southern hemisphere. The reason why ozone thinning is greatest over polar areas is because seasonal circular air currents, such as the polar vortex, trap the CFCs for months at a time, and because high-altitude ice crystals accelerate the ability to deplete ozone. If there is now less ozone, more UV radiation is reaching the Earth's surface, where it directly harms living tissue and impacts materials such as paint or rubber. Due to the process of photodegradation, it is also one of the main factors driving the decay of plastics in the ocean, which leads to the formation of microplastics. 
We already talked about microplastics in one of our previous videos, so you might want to check this out as well. In the sea and underwater, the penetrating UV light plays an important role, especially for plants and animals that live in a symbiosis with algae. All these organisms rely on sunlight and can therefore only live in the upper 200 meters of the sea, the so-called euphotic zone. If you want to know more about the influence of photosynthetically active radiation, meaning the part of the sunlight that plants can use for photosynthesis, you might also want to check our previous video on light underwater. The organisms in these shallow waters are therefore often exposed to highly energetic UV radiation. This can have negative consequences for them. And for the rest of this video, we will talk about some of these impacts and introduce you to some of the protective mechanisms that these organisms develop to protect themselves. We know, for example, that UVB influences the fatty acid, lipid and sterile composition in marine phytoplankton species of the Antarctic. As phytoplankton forms the basis of the marine food web, the changes can ultimately also alter the overall nutritional quality of the food available for higher trophic levels. By the way, if you want to know more about these trophic levels and the food web, stay tuned, as we will talk about it in our next video. Another example would be the coral trout, where studies found that specimens from the Great Barrier Reef show these skin lesions, with strong similarities to UV-induced melanomas, which are assumed to be caused by the exposure to high levels of UV radiation. It is not yet clear if this is indeed some kind of skin cancer, or shall we say scale cancer, but the scientists found strong similarities between the lesions they found and those that were previously reported from lab experiments after the exposure to high UV. In these lab experiments, the UV radiation also led to the growth of tumors, and those specimens that were affected usually survived only for around six months, compared to an average four years in a healthy fish. In marine plants, including seagrasses and algae, high levels of UV damages cell membranes and all organelles within the cell, including the chloroplast, mitochondria and DNA within the nucleus. Damage to these cell organelles directly or indirectly affects basic plant metabolic processes, such as photosynthesis, respiration, growth and reproduction. Especially these immobile organisms, like plants or sessile animals, therefore had to develop different strategies to cope with this radiation. The seagrass species Halophila stipulacea, for example, has been shown to use a clumping, as it is called by the scientists, of their chloroplast under high UV stress. This protects the plant as it lowers the overall electron transport rates, for example during midday, as they would otherwise lead to potentially harmful high energy levels in the cells. This chloroplast clumping was therefore concluded to function as a means of protecting most chloroplasts from high irradiances, including UVR. The Coccolithophorite emiliana haxali, a phytoplankton species that covers itself with small scales, the coccolids, made of calcium carbonate, is assumed to be able to backscatter intense solar radiation, including UV. Scientists assume that they are quite effective in doing so, reflecting up to 50% of the harmful radiation. Other marine organisms, including those that harbor symbiotic algae, such as the corals, use special UV-absorbing compounds, such as the microsporine-like amino acids or fluorescent pigments that serve as a sun protection. And then there is, of course, also the mechanisms of avoidance, where mobile fauna, like fishes or other animals, search shelter, for example inside a reef during the day, and especially during noontime, when the sun is highest, and thus also the radiation that penetrates the water column is highest. These are only a few mechanisms that marine organisms use, including the simple avoidance and use of physical barriers, to the use of UV-absorbing compounds and antioxidants, up to very effective repair and resynthesis mechanisms in some organisms. Especially sessile organisms that cannot move or seek shelter from high solar irradiances had to evolve some quite advanced systems here. And in one of our next videos we will tell you how, for example, the photosymbiotic giant clams developed their very own photoprotective mechanisms to cope with high solar irradiances in the shallow reefs where these clams live.